As I've mentioned many times before, when you're traveling in space, your top three priorities are power, power and power. And when you're far away from the Earth, say out at Jupiter, the amount of solar energy that you can collect is about 1 25th what you can when you're at Earth. And so it makes sense to switch to some kind of nuclear version. And we've seen these nuclear batteries in the past on say the Cassini spacecraft, Galileo, the Voyagers, and they have their place, but they don't produce a lot of electricity. And so the other possibility is to use a fission reactor. And actually NASA is considering these with their kilo power reactor concept that we could see these small fission reactors on the moon to power say future lunar bases. And one of the big applications of nuclear reactors is to somehow melt down through the ice on places like Europa or Enceladus, where the heat from the reactor is allowing your probe to melt slowly through kilometers of ice, it'll take you years, but you could reach the ocean down below. And the traditional idea has been a, a nuclear an RTG like on the Voyagers or a fission reactor. But there's another idea that NASA has been working on for a few years, and it's called a lattice confinement fusion fast fission reactor. And it's very complicated. And I didn't really understand it going into it. And so we spend a lot of this interview talking about how this reactor would work, how it would be different from other traditional nuclear reactors that you might be familiar with, and what its advantages and disadvantages are. And it's a pretty exciting idea. And we get into sort of the specific application for melting ice on Europa or Enceladus, but actually the general purpose applications of this kind of a reactor for providing power for providing propulsion, you can kind of pull out the traditional fission reactor idea and plop this lattice confinement fusion reactor into the same hole and you get some in really interesting applications in the future of human space exploration. So enjoy another NIAC grant interview. Today I'm talking with uh, Teresa Benio and Lawrence Forsley from NASA. How how bad how like how tough is the ice on Europa compared to the kind of ice like are, are we have do we have any experience with ice like that? We've drilled through about two miles of ice in Greenland and in Antarctica, and the ice in uh, Europa and Enceladus is nothing like it. It's as much as 20 to 30 miles thick. It's got vacuum and cryogenic temperatures, hundreds of degrees below zero on the surface. And presumably the water 30 miles down uh, is liquid. So we have no experience with this. Does the lower gravity have any change in the consistency of the ice itself? Undoubtedly. Again, we have no experience with that either. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. And I mean, you know, we've been also excited about the possibility of finding life on Europa. It's the most kind of Earth like place there is when you, once you get to the liquid water. But the big question is, how do you get through tens of kilometers of ice to reach the water down below? Teresa, can you talk about like some of the methods that have been proposed so far? Right. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, melt the ice, you know, apply heat to it, make it water so you can flow through it. Um, that that may be, you know, good to start with, but, um, you know, at these at these temperatures, it could be that, you know, you don't melt it enough or not enough gets melted and you're stuck. So another method that would be used along with heating and melting is kind of a drilling, maybe with the auger or some ultrasonic vibration that will break away, um, you know, uh, some, some of the ice and, and, you know, it would, it would work, you know, together. And we've we've discussed this several times on the on the channel and in on definitely in print on universe today, I guess digital print. And the the traditional idea is you have some nuclear reactor sitting like an RTG, like the kind of thing you have on curiosity, or maybe something beefier that is just melting slowly. And then the ice is freezing behind. 
So where did the idea of this uh, lattice, fusion lattice idea come from? Yeah, some of the work that we did at the Navy um, in San Diego, then Spayware, now Ny Nywick, um, we did experiments and we found that we could actually um, load a fuel, a nuclear fuel, in this case, actually it's deuterium, and we could actually induce nuclear reactions. And we picked this work up over at NASA, replicated many of the results, and then continued on with a set of papers that uh, Teresa is also one of the co-authors on, published in Fizrev C. And I mean, we're sort of a few weeks after the announcement of ignition at the National Ignition Laboratory. And of course, folks in Europe are working on the ITER fusion and tokamak reactors and various fusion facilities have been in operation. They haven't necessarily been wonderful power generating systems yet. And so where are we in the harnessing fusion for activities like this? Because I, I think for most people feel like, oh, no, a fusion, that's that thing that's either a thermonuclear weapon or it is 30 years away. But you're talking about practical applications of fusion today. So where are we at with fusion? Well, one of the things that comes to the fore, um, I was in laser fusion for 13 years, and I actually know some of the people on the Livermore team. And I also worked on a tokamak at Max Planck, which is the uh, progenitor for some of the work being done in ITER. And as you say, neither one of them has shown the ability to produce power. There are many orders of magnitude off in what you put in and what you get out. The beauty of what we're doing, and I think Teresa can address this further, is by using a lattice to hold deuterium, we are able to dispense with the magnets, and we're able to dispense with the lasers and all of the power that that takes. So I guess, Teresa, what, what is going on with the lattice and how do you turn deuterium in a lattice into heat? So as, as Larry mentioned, the, um, the lattice of metal atoms um, is in kind of like a cube for formation. And the deuterium gas nestles in vacant vacancies, open areas within that that lattice, because it, it's all like spherical. At least that's you know what the current theory is. And so, what it what is beneficial with the um, metal is that um, it has a lot of electrons. And in our theory, electrons is a very critical component of enabling DD fusion. Um, because the deuterons, which is the nucleus of a deuterium atom, is a positive charge. It's, it's positively charged, just like a proton is positively charged. A neutron is, is neutral, so a neutron can go wherever it may please. So the electrons are negative charge. So if you have a, a, a screen in between two positive charges, that negative screen will make the other positive charged particle on the other side look neutral to itself. So it reduces that, that repel, rep, repelling um, action that it wants to take with two positive charges. And so normally you've got the situation where you've got these, these positive ions are attempting to push away from each other, but because you've got them trapped in this lattice, they can't go anywhere. And so they're stuck in this shape that you've this prison that you've created for it. Ba now, there's, basically, yes. There's right. one other aspect that's crucial to this. The electron screening gives rise to what we call a cold plasma. And that's not our term. That's actually from the physics literature. And it turns out the electron screening gives you the equivalent of up to 4,000 electron volts of equivalent energy. Well, 4 keV is 44 million degrees. Hmm. So by using this technique without using the magnets, but because everyone's in close proximity, as Teresa points out, you have now overcome the barrier and you're now on the way to inducing the fusion reactions. But but I'm guessing like at the ends of this lattice, it's at a certain point you there's nobody 
to put to the right or to the left of the lattice. Like at a certain point, you reach the, you know, the end of the line. So how does that, how does that, how do you work with that? Well, one of the things you can do is you can keep this in a pressurized system, pressurized gas, or you can use a liquid metal so that you always are in fact bathed in the nuclear fuel, which is deuterium, which is not even radioactive. So then how is this fusion? I mean, I, like I'm sort of imagining these deuterium atoms that are in this lattice, they are jostling around, pushing against each other, but they're staying in place. Where does this and you mentioned there's like a whole bunch of essentially, you know, there's there's four MEV, you said coming off of these, these atoms. How do you turn this in? Like, where does the fusion part? How do you bring them together? Yeah. So, so another aspect of this is a trigger. Um, there's a triggering mechanism, and um, there's various ways to do that. In our uh, FizRev C journal papers, we documented the experiments that we did that used a gamma beam um, to to focus on this deuterated metal. Uh, lattice and so what that gamma beam did was impart kinetic energy into that lattice and in some cases would break apart some of the deuterons into a proton and then and its neutron um, at a certain energy that that ha can happen so that kinetic energy that broke apart um, that deuteron so now you have energy that's imparted onto the proton and the neutron. Well, like I said before, the neutron's neutral, so it can travel anywhere it wants to. So in, in our experiment, we believe that, that that highly kinetic energy neutron's moving around and it imparts some of its kinetic energy onto a deuteron that's resting in the lattice. So that one then starts moving. And then with that electron screening, will fuse into a deuteron that's at rest in somewhere else in the lattice. So it, it feels a bit like a thermonuclear explosion, but in slow motion. I got Larry, I guess. So what do you, what do you, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it. An I don't explosion. know. Yeah. 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 A Here, thermonuclear a, reaction. Like it just, yeah. like I think about like yeah. that, you know, using this, cascade of of hydrogen or you know deuterium or tritium coming together releases a tremendous amount of energy and you're doing this but it sounds like you know with all of the lattice and all of the shenanigans that the atoms have to get to to get to each other it slows the whole process down and so you don't get an explosion you get a release of heat so uh, there's a couple ways of thinking about this the way um, hot fusion research has been done as opposed to using a cold plasma. I liken to karate. You hit things as hard as you can, hope for the best. <laughs> what we're doing, what we're doing is more like judo or a kaido where we use our opponent's strength, in this case, the lattice to not only hold things together, but to promote the ability of these particles to fuse. And, and the other part that's very important is there's a limit on how many particles per cubic centimeter you can have with the tokamak. It's a big number, it's 10 to the 14, but solid matter is 10 to the 23. That's 23 zeros. So we're nine orders of magnitude, a billion times denser with our fuel in the lattice than you are in a tokamak. The flip side with the laser fusion is they go perhaps a thousand times denser than we are as solid matter but they only last for a billionth of a second. Whereas in the lattice, we maintain the high density indefinitely. That's really the key to what we're doing along with the electron screening that Teresa brought up. And so it really does feel a bit like a hybrid then between those two methodologies. You're confining things very closely, but not as close as you would in an ignition reaction, but definitely more than tokamak, but you're also, I guess, bringing more, you're still bringing it more closely combined to kind of get that that middle ground. So let's let's talk about how this would then compare like if I just went and took a tokamak reactor and stuck it on the surface of Europa. 
right? <laughs> or or the Livermore Labs ignition facility and just place it out on Europa and just let it go to work, um, slowly melting its way down through the through the world. How does this sort of what is the profile that you're looking for for it to to sort of do its job as a melt probe on Europa? I mean, I understand this is what the NIAC grant might be. The NIAC grant might be for this purpose, right? Like you're going to now to spend nine months figuring out. I mean, like, I guess I'm just imagining what would the thing look like? What would the device look like? You know, I, I, I'm imagining ITER and I'm imagining, you know, the Lawrence Livermore facility. Oh, well, yeah, I guess maybe we will probably talk about the uh, hybrid fusion fission aspect of, of this uh robot and that's power supply right larry is that what that sounds yeah, good yeah and in comparison yeah. to the size of eater or nif yeah yeah oh yeah, yeah. and it, you know buildings parking lots you know everything yeah um because i th we believe that last confinement fusion alone wouldn't give you the necessary heat that would be needed to operate this uh, robotic probe um so we're taking the the best of each, the best of fusion, the best of fission, and combining it together. Um, the fission would would enable us to get a lot more heat out, um, but using non-fissile material, you need a different way to start it out. Um, or actually, we're using the non-fissile material as an advantage for less safety and less cost. but you can fission that material with neutrons that come from the the last confinement fusion dd reactions so the energy of those neutrons will enable the fission in the non-fissile material right but i'm like like i'm imagining this block of metal that is your lattice and it is of a certain size that we that is somewhere smaller than eider and and I am imagining some kind of laser that you mentioned that you're going to be pulsing into this heated up again, probably smaller than than the ignition facility. So what what is this thing going to look like this whole the whole machine that is now on plopped on the surface of of Europa? What am I looking at? So the actual heart of the reactor is probably the size of a coffee can. Okay as opposed to a six story building eater yes. or a three and a half story building NIF. Um, what turns out is what we refer to as the plumbing is much bigger than the reactor. And we base this on NASA's and um, DOE's earlier kilopower, where if you look at the mass budget, you have to have cooling fins for waste heat. You've got a whole bunch of things in there, which are easily five times the volume and mass. So in our case, we would make use most likely of all of the existing infrastructure for the plumbing, but we would replace the reactor or the potentially the um, graphite enclosed uh, plutonium-238 heat source with our device instead. There are some other interesting things too. The, um, the use of a fission reactor, at least in one of the compass studies that was done at NASA Glenn, indicated that you had to make the probe about twice the diameter, which means it's harder to melt through the ice with something big than something small. So they have a power budget of 43 kilowatts thermal. However, if you use the plutonium 238, you only need about 12 kilowatts because it's a much smaller device. So we're trying to look where we might fall between those two, but I think a good estimate is the reactor core itself is probably the size of a coffee can. Right, right. And like, I know that the profile of the probe, the melt probe itself dramatically changes the length of time that your journey is going to take. If the cross section of the probe is one size, maybe it only takes you a couple of years. But if the if the probe is larger, and maybe has lots of cool little submarines inside and and other devices that you need, maybe it's going to be bigger. And then maybe it's going to take you five years to get down through the ice depending, you know, really the the speed that you can travel is limited by the by the, the cross section of your of your device. And I have, you know, we've covered the kilopower. And so for example, if I recall, like you're looking at like 200 kilowatts 
ish for these fission reactors that NASA is is looking at. Well, the study um, the study that was done for a particular probe design, it's not all inclusive and we don't know a lot of the details, was only 43 kilowatts, which would be the equivalent of essentially four kilopower reactors or a larger reactor. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so they're right. More like 10 kilowatts. Right. And so you would have, and so this system you're hoping would deliver about, you say what, about, about 40 kilowatts of power? I, I think somewhere under a hundred, most of it, if it's going to melt, you don't want to, you just want to melt, but yep. you've got a power budget to run the device and to run the instrumentation. So you could conceivably use an advanced Stirling engine, which will get you perhaps 20 to 25% conversion efficiency, which means you produce electricity. But again, whenever you produce electricity and you use the electricity, you're still producing heat. So it's yes. not like you've lost heat for electricity. Right, right. The waste heat is exactly what you were hoping for. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. And so then what's the, the lifetime? Like, you know, you've got this coffee can sized fuel source, the reactor. How long will this let you operate for? Well, as I mean, as long as you have the deuterium there as your fuel, almost indefinitely, um, you know, uh, we haven't done a lot of scale up studies yet, although this would enable us to to work that aspect of the technology a little bit more. Um, uh, but yeah, so we don't have a definite answer right, right now. I mean, it's, a, you know, nobody is going to come to refuel it. It's 10 kilometers under the ice. The <laughs> borehole has frozen solid again. Uh, so it's got to just last on the fuel. But I mean, are we looking, is it something that's equivalent to like some of the RTGs on the Voyagers? Are we looking at decades time frame, or are we looking at just a couple of years? Do you think? Re real realistically, I think we're probably looking at a mission profile. We would have to run five to 10 years. Yeah, and that sounds reasonable. Yep. And so it'll go through its fuel in five to 10 years and then run out of heat. We would make a trade off between the size of the reactor, the amount of fuel we have to bring, mm -hmm. the length of the duration of the mission. Right. Yeah. You, know, you can imagine if you make it bigger, it'll last longer. Yeah. Yeah. We right. still have to work out all those details. Yeah. Yeah. Or bring a second reactor and then pop out the first mm -hmm. one and put in the mm -hmm. second one mm -hmm. if these things are, are coffee can sized. So, I mean, Obviously, you know, you're at the the NIAC. This is a stage one NIAC grant, and this is you're in blue sky territory. So what are you hoping to deliver at the end of this process? Uh, well, we're hoping to uh, deliver a design for a hybrid uh, fusion fission reactor. Um, you know, in a, we're doing strictly modeling. Uh, looking at the power requirements, the robotic requirements, the probe requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So, but at, yeah, at the end, we'd like to have a, a design for a, um, uh, a, the reactor and the probe itself. Um, and then hopefully go on to phase two and, um, you know, actually do some experiments with our design and keep building things up. Is, is anybody else working with this kind of a design or for other applications that aren't just melting through kilometers of ice on Europa? This has been looked at a number of times. The original decadal survey from 10 years ago uh, pointed out that getting to icy worlds and getting to the ocean beneath that we suspect is there first focused on Europa. The latest one that came out um, caused us to look at uh, Enceladus around Saturn. In both cases, a number of groups, and I think perhaps the NASA Glenn group, the furthest, have looked at the power requirements and all of the other issues, communications and everything else. Um, but all of them come down to the same problem. How do you get through the ice? And having gotten through the ice, how do you tell the surface that you did it? 
Right, right. And, and we've covered profiles of that in the past, like you're spooling out some kind of wire behind you in the water as you're as you're melting down and then it freezes inside. And so you've got to tether back to the surface. And it seems tough. But as long as you're careful, uh, you can have a fairly thin cable that you're running back up to the to the surface. So what do you think are the big technical challenges, the big risks in moving forward with this idea? Well, the power supply, however, it's done is probably the primary one. And then there's all of the secondary ones that you mentioned. For example, if you do lay a cable down, you run the high, very high probability risk that the ice will shift under the tidal influences of either Jupiter or Saturn, and it'll shear your cable. And then the other problem is that if you look at the absorption characteristics for radio frequency through ice, it's not very good. Right? Yeah, yeah, you've got like a couple of meters and then that's it. You know, um, now, now, you know, you're talking about this idea as because it can bring a lot of heat to to the to the roll for being able to melt down. But do, but do you see this idea as a more general purpose power system? Because, you know, the big problem in exploring the outer solar system is, you know, your top three challenges are power, power and power. Um, you know, do you think this has applications? not enclosed in ice? Yes, yeah. Oh, yes, most definitely. Um, we could use it as uh, a power source for a, a lunar base. Um, we could use it terrestrially. I mean, you know, our, uh, we, you know, our clean energy initiative uh, led by President uh, is, is definitely something that um, we could contribute to uh, with this tech type of technology. Um, we could also uh, use this for propulsion purposes as well. Um, How? Can you explain that? I'm going to defer that one to Larry sure. on the propulsion. So, there, well, right now there is an effort going on between NASA, DARPA, and DOE looking at nuclear thermal propulsion. So the idea is you get twice what we refer to as impulse seconds, maybe three times, over chemical rockets because you can heat fuel and throw it out the back end of the rocket at a higher velocity. Um, there's another one which is nuclear electric propulsion and we currently use this as solar electric propulsion on a variety of spacecraft that are exploring more or less uh, out as far as Jupiter. But um, if you want to go much further or you want to go much faster, you're now trading off the size of the solar panels on Juno. I think they're 60 feet across because there's not much sunlight out there. So if you can have a compact nuclear source, you can use that to essentially electrify grids and send xenon or mercury out the back end of the spacecraft. Yeah, and I know that one of the other NASA grants is for this bimodal nuclear plant where you've got the 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 thermal propulsion from some kind of fission reactor that's using say hydrogen as a propellant and then you match that with the electricity that's being generated by the reactor and use that to power your electric propulsion system and so you have the two going side by side and so are you saying that you could pull out the fission reactor and plop in this lattice confinement fusion fast but hold on, lattice. Yes. We need, we, need, we need to catch your name. But anyway, <laughs> this what, this lattice confinement system, and have it perform roughly the same function as the fission reactor that that it was using before. Actually, I can give you a, a name for it. Um, when we began developing this with the Navy, we referred to it as Genie. Genie. Genie for green nuclear energy. Okay. Uh, a genie reactor. I like that. That's genie cool. Reactor. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll see if we can make that stick. <laughs> um, but, but, but then I guess, what are the, what are the possible implications? Like, I think, we, you know, we all have in our mind that the risks associated with putting a blob of plutonium onto a spacecraft and launching it into space. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously this happens with the RTGs that are on, Cassini and Galileo and the Voyagers and Perseverance and, you know, they go on and on. Sure. Yep. So we've, we've seen, we've done this before. And so I know that, that the risks are very low in, in that, but I think for still there's 
you know, I think a good rule is send as few kilograms of plutonium th into orbit as right. possible. Um, so what are the, I guess, what are the, the implications that if you do, if you're able to sort of switch over to this, I mean, well, your launch cost and safety will be much less mm -hmm. because what you're in, in what we're envisioning and we've already demonstrated is we've been able to fission depleted uranium, natural uranium and thorium. So these have very low radioactivity. And so none of the proliferation concerns of launching, for example, enriched uranium would exist. And what about the, the manufacturing bottlenecks? We've used uranium wire in the past. <laughs> right. It's, I mean, it's, I know that, that there are like, there is only so much of the really enriched plutonium available. There's only so many centrifuges that are producing this kind of stuff. And so are the kinds of materials that you would be using more readily available than, than those more highly enriched sources. We're, we're using the starting yes. stock that they enrich. We have no enrichment. We're using right. uranium as it comes out of the ground and turned into a metallic <laughs> form. Right. Okay. Okay. So something that's a lot easier to get your hands on. And so then you wouldn't be really be constrained by the amount of these kinds of reactors that you could send into space. I think that's true. And there's another advantage too. both thorium and uranium are present on the moon and they're likely present on Mars as well. You can't imagine building huge centrifuges to enrich uranium to run power yeah. systems on right. either. On the other hand, if you can get the uranium out of the ground and concentrate it without right. enriching it, you have a much easier way of building your fuel stocks in situ. And right. and there theoretically are going to be asteroids out there that have chunks of uranium in them that you could harvest. I don't know about chunks. It'll be distributed to parts per million. I'm not right. saying it's going to be easy to find it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, of course, of course. And then what about like scale? I mean, like, like how, f how far do you think you could scale this technology up? Like the size of reactor power generation? Because there are some really interesting missions that were considered in the past. I mean, the one that I really liked was this idea to send this battleship to, to <laughs> Jupiter. And it would, it would have you know, it would go to each one of the Jovian moons in order and it had this nuclear electric propulsion system and it was shelved, you know, what a surprise. But if you could generate like a ton of power, you get some really interesting missions, chase down Oumuamua, um, retrieve a sample, things like things like that. Where do you think is the upper limits of this kind of technology? Scratch my head because we really, we really <laughs> haven't thought of that uh in the big 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 picture um it's um you know as much as metal as you can do to rate i mean let's go for it um <laughs> right these, so i guess if you made a yeah a, a I, wine barrel sized version would it still function do you think yes as opposed to the coffee yeah. can sized yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it would because here's the thing in what we're proposing in the NIAC proposal that's been accepted, um, we're going to be looking at what the geometry is and how the scaling would work. And it really comes down to, at least in this case, in neutron economy. You were mentioning it yourself earlier. You know, when you get to the edges, what happens? Well, the fuel you can probably keep in there, but the neutrons tend to head out. Mm -hmm. So what's the best geometry to conserve the neutrons to maintain the reaction? And in principle, it's the same problem that conventional reactors have, except that we're making up for the neutrons. We're not relying on a chain reaction. We are producing these under a controlled way using our fusion or lattice confinement fusion. Right. Right, right. And so, you know, like I know with that, the, the bimodal, the, the hybrid nuclear uh, propulsion system, and I haven't had a chance to interview them yet. I don't know if I will, I hope to. Um, mm -hmm. They were looking at ISPs in the 1600 to 2000 range. And so do you sort of feel like you would fall in that same range? Well, if if we are basically heating fuel up to the same temperature, we will. Yeah. And that's the key. The question yeah. for us to resolve is how high can how hot can we get before we start losing the fuel within the reactor itself? 
So it might be that we are better than chemical, but not as good as that. The flip side of this is that the way in which the reaction works, we produce an enormous number of charged particles. And Teresa and I gave a talk at the American Nuclear Society, and that's 22, talking about a high ISP reaction. High ISP on the order of 10 to the seven, 10 million seconds. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now, bear in mind, the problem is high ISP well, is contradicted is, by high thrust. Yeah, right. It does it. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. And I understand that, you know, like we're, we're well beyond the scope of, of the NIAC grant that you are specifically working on, but that's okay. You know, this is, this is fun. Um, and it's so people who are listening to this to understand this is, Total speculation has nothing to do specifically with this technology. But um, explain to me sort of how this, how, like, how do you get those kinds of, of ISPs in this seven figure? Okay, so we have measured um, using nuclear track detectors that we get fast alphas coming off at five to six million electron volts. That's going at 5% the speed of light. And because an alpha particle has a charge, you can direct it magnetically. Now there are issues with how do you detach that particle from your spacecraft so that it goes out one end and doesn't come back around on you, for example. Right, right. But if you've got particles leaving at 5% the speed of light, you're now looking at ISPs, impulse in seconds of huge amounts. And so similar to say like an ion drive where you have these ions that you are you are directing out the back of your spacecraft using some kind of magnetic containment, yes. you're going to have the same some kind of magnetic nozzle that is taking these alpha particles that are popping out of this reaction and you are directing them in the in the direction that you want to receive your your thrust in the opposite direction. That's correct. Right. That's really cool. I like that a lot. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, that's a completely separate NIAC grant, but, yes. um, <laughs> but it's sure. a, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but it's yeah. A, but it's an, yeah, it's an exciting idea. I mean, I think, you know, the, I mean, we're so, we're so accustomed to, to chemical rockets. Mm -hmm. Ion drives are amazing, long lasting sip fuel, but they have their downsides as well about getting electricity. But I mean, I think we're all really excited about what could we do to get us out into that interstellar range to explore the interstellar medium to reach the solar gravitational lens to get to another star that would be great in our lifetimes. Do you think that this technology is on the table for viable ways to maybe reach another star i love the idea i'll consider it but okay. it won't happen in my lifetime <laughs> <laughs> or at least to get out to interstellar space you know catch the, some voyagers and and bring them home for study oh, that's a sweet thought yeah yeah, yeah wouldn't that be amazing no i just say the, the probably they're going to be hard to find in a year or two because their battery is just about dead <laughs> yeah i know i know it's it's heartbreaking to think i mean like my entire life like I was, I was born just a few years before the Voyagers launched, and they're sort of like they're the they're the spacecraft that I think that I know or I has been present with me for most of my kind of conscious life. I remember them doing the flybys of of Jupiter and Saturn, and I remember I was in high school when they went past uh, Uranus and, and Neptune and still we report on them sending signals home. So it's, it's amazing. And I, yeah, yeah. And to yeah, that's, I mean, out. that's the thing with NASA. We design things such that we, we over design, but you know, and we, and, and we're like, okay, this is how long our mission goes, but then the capabilities that we build with, with the, whole instrumentation we're, we we enable ourselves to to really lit, have these missions last much longer look at some of the mars rovers and, and all that i mean it, it's just incredible yeah i think um, in some we, cases it must feel a bit like adopting a parrot or a turtle like if you're gonna yeah, be right. the principal investigator right. of a mission <laughs> yeah exactly you know it just remember 
<laughs> that this might be at, what you retire at, from. Yeah, but look at the return on investment yeah. that we're getting as far as data. Many, many years more uh, of data than originally planned. So it really is is a great thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Teresa and Larry, what is the next step then? What can people expect as you now work on your NIAC proposal? Not grant, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get a design uh, established for this hybrid fusion fission reactor. Um, I, I'm, I'm very excited to, to investigate the different configurations that we're looking at with uh, depleted uranium, natural uranium, thorium, um, and, and just excited about, you know, the studies, you know, what's the geometry, you know, um, get the requirements for the mission uh, established where we can really go forward um, and make this more real. You know, right now we're talking in high, high levels and, well, we expect it to look like this or that or this size, you know, coffee can size, et cetera, et cetera. But until we really get this modeling um, completed, um, we're not really sure. And I'm excited to get to mm -hmm. that point. Wonderful. Well, uh, both of you, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And I am definitely looking forward to uh, what comes out. Like, I really want to see what's under the ice on Europa oh, yeah. Enceladus. So anyone who can help get us closer to that, I am uh, I am excited about this. So thank you so much for taking yes. the time to talk with me today. Well, You're welcome. For us. All right, sure. take care. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.